We're good. Thank you. Um, and I'm Lucas La Rochelle. I'm from Montreal. Um, I'll be leading the workshop today on a project that I started a year ago called Queering the Map. Um, and my pronouns are they and them. Um, I'm Maddie. I use they them pronouns. And I'm from Boston. And I'm not sure. Anything else to say? That's good. <laughs> Um, my name is Tyler. I use he and his pronouns. I am currently a doctoral student at the Annenberg School for Communication at USC. I'm Israel. I'm uh, he and his. I'm a PhD student in religious studies at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm Haley Peterson. I use they, them. I am also at UNC Chapel Hill on the MA PhD track. Um, my interests are gender, transgender, and feminism. Okay, and my name is Alicia Gaspar de Alba. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Oh yeah, you have my button right there. Uh, I'm originally from the border of El Paso, Texas, uh, but I've actually lived now in Los Angeles as long as I lived there, so I guess now I'm a, a kind of an Angelina. <laughs> yeah, and I teach all over the place. Yeah. Okay, I'm Emma Perez, and actually this is my alma mater for both MABA. PhD. Oh, for all three? All three. Mm -hmm. I, was, I lived here for 14 years when I was a kid. And then um, was at CU Boulder and now at University of Arizona where I'm really loving it, um, in GWS. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and my pronouns are uh, she, the she, her. Uh, except in Spanish, I tend to like the O and the Xs. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And for having me here. Thank you. Are you kidding? Um, so I wanted to start with um, a story to okay. speak to how Queering the Map started. Okay. Um, so there's this tree in Parc Jean Mans, um, which is a tree by the house that I've lived in for the past six years. Um, and I bike by this tree every day to and from school. Um, and at this, this tree is where I met my first successful, I guess, long-term partnership. Um, and it's also the tree at which uh, I had my sort of first relatively explosive um, coming out about my non-binary gender. Um, and so this tree holds a significant amount of queer feeling for me, uh, despite not being legible as such in any real way outside of that. Um, and so as I was continuing this one particular bike ride, I began to think about all of the other places that held that kind of queer feeling for me, that grounded me in, in, in my queerness and relationship to place. Um, and so I thought about the, this big, huge red shipping container by my childhood home, where my first love and I would meet um, with ritualistic earnestness to discuss our um, desires for one another and the barriers to their full expression. Um, I thought about this, uh, um, baseball field in Parc Laurier in Montreal, where in the summer, which is not pictured here because currently Google Maps only has winter images of <laughs> Parc Laurier, um, my, a friend of mine gave me her pink slip and I, um, and I danced around defiantly in the baseball field and felt validated in my, in my gender queerness. Um, I thought about, continued on that bike, or as I continued that bike ride, I thought about another, um, a place in Montreal, a street corner, um, where I, with someone that I was falling in love with, kissed for 20 minutes, and sort of straddled the feeling of being in between the excitement of, of falling in love, and the very real fear of homophobic or transphobic violence occurring there, which thankfully it did not. Um, and so, uh, I sort of, I continued these kinds of musings, thinking about locating myself and my queerness in relationship to place um, as I continued that bike ride, but started to get a little bit bored at a certain um, period, thinking about my own experience, um, and, and started to wonder what it could be like to move through an environment um, that was animated by queer past, queer present, and how that could inform how we move through the world in the future. Um, and not to belittle the amount of labor that then ensued in terms of um, getting this project off the ground, but from that sort of um, beginning, I started to code um, the beginning of Queering the Map, um, which if, if um, I don't know if anyone has seen or interacted with Queering the Map before, um, but it's a community-generated mapping project that geolocates queer moments, memories, and histories in relationship to physical space. 
And so the intent is to leave queerness as open to interpretation. Um, so rather than trying to define exactly what that means, and uh, leave, it, leave it as open to interpretation, but base it in an action. So rather than one, one, um, one cannot be queer necessarily, but one is doing queer in the context of this environment. And the idea behind that is to sort of keep, keep queerness in, in its radical direction, rather than something that one can be, and then can become commodified, and then sold back. That's great. Um, and so that, that, that's sort of one of the theoretical underpinnings of the project. And so when I started this project, um, it was about 15 points that I had laid out um, on the map that held a particular significance to me in relationship to my personal history of, of queerness. Um, and then I um, continued the project as part of a residency at the Concordia Fine Arts Reading Room where I um, effectively queered the computers. Um, so it's, a, it's essentially a small library. There's uh, 15 computers in the library. And I set the background images to querying the map. And I forced the browsers to load querying the map when opened. And if you didn't want to look at this thing and you wanted to do something else and you tried to open a new tab, querying the map would also load on that tab. Um, <laughs> so it was a little awesome. bit of forced interaction, but it worked um, really well. So over the course of this six That's month residency, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. She did it. Um, and so over the course of this, uh, this residency of six months, um, the points grew from the sort of 15 of my own um, to just over 600. Um, and they started in Montreal, which is where I had sort of intended the project to be. It was mostly a project for me and my community. Mm -hmm. um, but other people, it, it, it threw the digital networks, it, it escaped that network, um, and points started to, started to show up in Toronto, then they started to show up in Vancouver, then a couple in Ottawa, then a couple in Georgetown, Ontario, where I'm from, which is this really small, conservative, hellscape town, um, of someone who I did not know, um, remarking experiences to that place, which was particularly impactful. Then points started to show up in the US, sort of in, in, in various places. And then they started to show up in Australia. And this was around the, the, the period of time where the yes vote on marriage was going through. And so it was a particularly fascinating case study in terms of people um, speaking to that, speaking to, to the yes vote on marriage, but simultaneously people in the same kind of geographic location speaking to more um, anarchist, radical, queer politics that wouldn't necessarily be aligned with um, with, with a marriage politic. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that six month residency and there were about 600 points on the map, um, I was blown away at the kind of the vulnerability that had been shared. Um, I think it's also important to note maybe, maybe <coughs> now um, the, uh, that, that querying the map at its baseline is, is um, hyper anonymous. So not only does one, essentially the way that querying the map works, which is fundamental, um, is you essentially um, click a point on the map, um, you're brought to this text box window, and you enter text about that location, um, defining, defining your action of queering space or a moment of queer history, um, and then you add it to that spot. Um, there's no user data that's taken, there's no location data that's taken, there's no way of tracking um, who the person is that, that, that has written this point, which I think is, and as, as I sort of continue in, 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 in thinking through this workshop, I think that's one of, the, that's sort of, I think, wh where, this, where, where this project has been, has worked so well, is the removal of, um, uh, of the individual to a certain extent from, the, from a collective mapping mm -hmm. of history. So you don't use GPS? No. No, so there's no, there's no, on, the, on our, on our, I mean, a browser always takes your location data mm -hmm. um, in terms of an IP address, which is a general right. arena. Yeah. Um, but querying the map doesn't take, doesn't store that data. So there's no way of, of, if someone was to infiltrate the database, there's no way of knowing, aside from the specific point that someone has clicked, yeah. which also by the ability, the zoom function is limited to a certain extent so that you, you can't really figure out 
exactly the location, but there's a general kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so the underpinning of that was also sort of like queering surveillance studies. Right. So thinking about like, sure, we can give up this information, but it actually doesn't reveal very much. If, if anything, it reveals that like any space can be queered and right. that it's not about a sort of static place, but something that's moving and flowing and resisting this kind of top-down surveillance. Um, so after that sort of that, that residency, I thought to myself, this is great, 600 points, so many beautiful stories have been shared, um, time to move on to something else. I was really, really wrong. Um, I woke up on February 8th, I think, um, and the project had gone viral, um, and it had jumped from, in a period of three days, I guess this had occurred, um, it jumped from the 600 points that were on the map to just over 6,500 points. Wow. Um, and they were all over the world. Um, and with that kind of success and that kind of visibility um, and my techno-utopian like, yeah, throw it on the internet, nothing bad is gonna happen. Um, ethos, something bad did happen. Uh -oh. um, and it was on the morning of February 11th, I woke up to a slew of emails oh, that alerted me to the fact that Queer in the Map had been spammed by Trump supporters yeah. um, who created pop-ups that anywhere when you clicked on the map, five would appear, and they would generate pop-ups either saying, make America, Queering the Map says, make America great again, um, or Queering the Map says, Donald Trump, best president. Oh, wow. So I took the site down, okay. um, and I sort of asked on the URL if there was anyone that had uh, the coding capabilities to help me solve this problem, to, to set up an infrastructure that would allow the project to continue, but at a much more secure, um, in a much more secure manner. And the response was overwhelming. Um, I received probably like 50 or so emails from different people um, offering their support to get the project back online. And that sort of whittled down to about 15 quite committed um, coders from all over the world um, who worked. We worked for about three months um, redoing the interface um, to get it to a level where um, it couldn't be spammed in the way that it was spammed before, that the database was super secure, and we added a moderation panel. Because oh. prior to that, the sort of idea was I was taking a sort of like queer curatorial perspective of, of I'm not the curator. This right. thing exists on the internet, and it's for other people to decide what they do oh, with yeah. it, yeah. Um, which sadly yeah. Yeah. didn't work yeah. so well. Yeah. So now there's a group of about 15 moderators oh, um, who, who, who work through all of the stories as they are added to the map. So we relaunched the project on April 3rd. Um, Did you the year again, Lucas? Uh, I started it in May 2017. Okay. Um, 2017. So, but then, so the following year, February 11th, was 2018. Yes. It's just recent. Yeah, very recently. Okay. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so we relaunched it on April 3rd. Um, and as of just last week, actually, we just hit 25,000. <laughs> of existence and on every single continent on the yeah crazy um the number of countries no there's 24 different languages that are currently represented on the map yeah it's Europe is completely covered yeah the US is almost completely covered yeah uh, Canada is covered. Canada is yeah. covered. Caribbean islands are covered. Sure. covered. South, Central America. Central America. Mm -hmm. Central America. Central America. Argentina. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. What a great project this is. Thank you. It's amazing. And you've never had any more hacking trouble. No. So now the sort of now the interesting trouble is is working through. People will. Um, write really interesting sort of like attempts at breaking through the system because what's really interesting in this project which i think will be like a research study of its own in the future um that i will do is is, is thinking about the ways in which people are self-representing on this project mm -hmm. um, because the writing style is so particular and it, it, it there's this sort of like confessional mode mm -hmm. that because of the lack of so the way that it the way that it looks i guess is um and this is sort of, they're I guess. Doing, they're doing auto ethnography. Yeah. Exactly. That's what yes, it is. They're yeah. doing um, auto historia. Auto historia. Auto historia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the work for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Auto historia. Well, you know, yeah. it's one other way of, there's so many ways of perceiving it. Totally. 
Yeah, but it's 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 fascinating then sort of, sort of seeing people that are trying to screw with the project will write in this sort of mode and then throw it but then we'll write it in a way cuz I think the assumption is that it that there that it's a bot um, that or that it's like an artificial intelligence that's that's moderating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you really have to cuz people have come up with really creative ways to try to sneak something in. Oh. Um, that's like really homophobic or really racist, but in in a sort of like in a structure that this. Oh, it's interesting. It's yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's also interesting in terms of like a critique of the project that like mm -hmm. in trying to do something so open necessarily by coming together, it's like one encounters the mode through which people are representing on this project, and then they write in a similar way. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of it's it's it was one which was one of the things that I was trying to resist, but has sort of it's become its own. Sure. Structure. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah, and so then, um, in terms of so so a little in, a little pre introduction into the workshop um, mm -hmm. today, um, uh, sort of a lot of the research that went into this project outside of the the, the personal anecdotal that um, f the emotions that led to the creation of this project. Um, was thinking about how we could design queer interfaces. What, a dig what, what digital media, particularly media on the internet, um, could look like if we incorporated queer um, decolonial feminist praxis in um, the design and infrastructure of these spaces. Um, and so one sort of e example that I was thinking through was, was uh, at a very base level, the endless scroll mm -hmm. of traditional social media channels. So that sort of locks you into this linear, teleological mode of encountering new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And particularly the, the prevalence, I mean, Twitter kind of notwithstanding, but because of the, the, um, the linking between the individual subject and the text or the image that produces the subject, there's this sort of, there's this attempt to solidify some sort of truth about subjectivity. Oh, okay. um, and so querying the map is sort of attempting to be a response to that where there is no, w w what could a social media platform looks like, look like in which the individual is not present or the individual is not the means through which we come to care for mm -hmm. a body, but rather it's a sort of distributed care. Mm -hmm. um, and so hence um, the sort of, I mean, and the mapping component was really important, but I was also really intrigued in um, the um, navigation structure of something like Google Maps. So you're, rather than on this endless scroll that's been predetermined, particularly through algorithms, um, you're in this sort of non-structured drag, zoom, click, a much more fluid kind of mode of, of, of coming to encounter people's um, stories and relationships to place. Um, and so this is just sort of something that, this is sort of continued, um, this is continuing in my research as I sort of use this project as a case study for um, thinking about how to design the web in a, in a, in a queer manner. Um, and I sort of mentioned that before, but also there's no sort of algorithm, there's no search function, there's no way of filtering through comments. It's really a sort of a, a queer in terms of its, its, its totally open mode of encountering. Um, and, and so this is a sort of resistance to the, mo the ways through which algorithms are, are constructed in which we come to understand ourselves, come to an, and come to an, blah, 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 come to understand each other and come to understand the world within a digital medium. Um, another component um, was reclaiming anonymity. So ultimately taking anonymity has sort of become the purview of the troll. Um, anonymity has become the purview of the sort of like 90s sex panic where like if someone isn't telling you the truth on the internet then they must be a predator of some kind. Mm -hmm. There could be no positivity to, um, or there could be nothing, nothing of value to um, the anonymity that the internet was sort of once promised to provide but then vis-a-vis -vis neoliberal social ethics that's been very much taken away and it's become a, perf a performance platform for the individual. Um, and so one sort of point on the map that I think speaks to this really well, and I want to hold this as we go into the workshop component as a kind of example of, of what the possibilities of, of, of imagining the web differently, imagining the web through, um, through a, a queer um, perspective. So this point, which is in the neighborhood of Cote de Neige in Montreal, um, reads, I'm 13. You tell me that your friend your friend saw me in a picture through MSN and asked who that cute boy was. I pretend to find it funny that someone thought I was a boy, but it gave me hope. It meant the world to me then and still does now. You probably won't remember this, but I hope you're doing well, summer girl. 
So in this context, anonymity or the sort of opacity that, um, that the webcam, I would assume, in this context provides, um, is a, it's a moment of misrecognition that allows for a different version of the self or in this context, a, a version of the self that's closer to how one understands oneself mm -hmm. to be seen vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. this medium. So in this context, it isn't about realness, it's not about performing a true self on the internet, but rather the internet is providing a zone through which misrecognition becomes um, generative. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, this, I wanted to conclude this with um, an interview that I did with Ruthless Magazine um, with a brilliant, brilliant writer, um, Angad Singh, um, and the, the opening of the conversation, we were, we were discussing anonymity in the context of this project. Um, and I had stated early in the interview that uh, when I had started this project, when it had gotten really big, I was really nervous about um, speaking about the project or speaking about it as it was attached to my name, um, because I think, I, I still think it does. It's sort of like, this is the choice that I've made to like continue the project. Um, but I, 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 in an ideal world, I too would be anonymous in this context um, because I think it takes it away to sort of, there's the sort of like in, in, doing, in doing interviews about this project, there's the sort of like specter of the neoliberal genius that comes up like, you did this project, you made it, you, you did this thing, now tell us all about it. Mm -hmm. When it's so much more fruitful to just look at the project and read all, because it's like I made a pink map and I put 15 things on it. Mm -hmm. It's the 25,000 stories that are on the map that, 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 that do the work of the project. Mm -hmm. um, and so in response to that, um, Angad wrote um, this beautiful opening which reads, um, it might sound like a strange aspiration to be anonymous, Maybe it's also strange that a project that assigns its participants blanket anonymity provides exactly the conditions necessary to give a diverse and persecuted demographic visibility. <laughs> but anonymity is distinct from invisibility. It presupposes a crowd in which to lose oneself, with which to be am amalgamated. Perhaps it touches on a sense of belonging that so many of us have lacked in our formative years in an othering world. In the case of Queering the Map, anonymity is the basis of our ability to become known. Really good. That's, really, that's so good. Mm -hmm. That's such a good quote. Yeah, he's an, he's he's an, an amazing. unbelievable, unbelievable, right? The whole article is like 10 out of 10. Um, and so then that brings me into um, the more interactive component of the workshop, um, or the workshop itself. Thank you for listening to me speak, um, which is called Protocols for a Queer Cyberspace. Um, and so the structure of this workshop, um, we've got some design tools around us. Um, so first, we're going to um, write down an experience um, that's located in cyberspace. So similar to the way that people are speaking about place, um, and often, and it sort of switches in between um, real place or virtual space um, in how people are articulating themselves in this project. So I want to, we'll individually kind of write down a quick little moment of, of some way that we've, in, some sort of queer moment that we've had that's been either mediated by the internet, been mediated by technology in some way. Um, yeah, super, super simple sort of like three to four line um, anecdote. So by mediated, do you mean things like taking a selfie somewhere? Yeah. Hosting your location somewhere or what yeah. kind of things? Um, I mean, so, so the example, um, the sort of example like in, in the presentation um, is this person talking about like being on MSN mm -hmm. Messenger mm -hmm. and that it's the medium of not necessarily the internet but in this case the webcam networked through the internet to another body that provides this moment of, of, of queer misrecognition that's so significant in this context for this person that however let's say 10 years later Queering the Map appears on the internet and it's, and it's pertinent enough in their memory to write down okay. this particular encounter with cyberspace as either a productive zone of, um, of queerness or, or, or something negative. It doesn't necessarily have to be. So we can think of like another example of this um, very directly is like if you think about um, the way in which like Tinder works, in which you're asked to, you can be a man or a woman, or you can be other. And then if you choose to be an other, you're, you're given a drop-down menu of the other sort of gender 
categories that you can be. And then once you've declared that, you go to another menu that says, but do you want to be in the filtered search as a man or as a woman? Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of um, garbage interface that like performs inclusivity, but then just flattens it again. <laughs> garbage interface, I like that. Is that your coin term? It might be. I think you should use that. Now. Absolutely. Garbage interface, yes. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of terms here. That... <laughs> so yeah, so I think that's the sort of, that's the aim of the workshop, I think, is, is, is really to like, can, can we imagine other interfaces? Can we imagine um, truly queered interfaces? I'm sort of providing through Queering the Map, like anonymity and, and this sort of like post-individual kind of collectivity as, as one way of doing that. Um, and so, yeah, if we, if, we, if we each write down an experience, and then together, um, there's this brilliant essay that I want to sort of ground in called Fierce.net. Imagining a Faggoty Web um, by D. Travers Scott. Um, and then once we've read that, then I want to sort of reframe the stories that we've told um, in terms of what, what more can we ask for. In the, he, he, he takes this sort of utopian, Munozian sort of, there's, the internet is like this, that it could be like this. Yeah. And you must sort of animate the like radical queer possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and then together we will um, co-create sort of protocols for a queer cyberspace mm -hmm. um, from the interfacing between this text and our stories. Mm -hmm. And then I have some design tools that we can sort of draw and imagine what, what would these online spaces look like? And or maybe they're not even online. Maybe the internet is something mm -hmm. that we need to divest from entirely. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's not what we're interested in in this, in this context. Um, and, and I think, yeah, the, the reading is really exciting to think about, like, what are the, is it, is it even the interface online, or is it the way he talks about um, uh, ways of, of dressing in relation to the internet, ways of, of, of moving um, around uh, a network technology? Um, yeah. All right. So how do we start? So there's worksheet number one, which is the, um, this one. This one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're setting up bad examples. There are no bad examples. Okay, so then what do we do? Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, just right, if, if something comes to your mind of, of a story about interfacing um, a, a queer experience in relationship to digital technology in some capacity. Okay. Okay. Or if it's easier to think of something that has nothing to do with the digital, that's also fine. Any sort of, 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 of queer experience in which evidently like space is implicated with architecture, with technology, with, with other bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess very broadly, um, an experience in relation to space, whether or not that's um, real space or virtual space.
the side of that, the, the part of the page with um, interview on the side, there was a thing about like the Mamma Mia sequel that had a like, quote and I had like Abba stuck in my head so badly. <laughs> wow, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, it's like a link to another article about why sequels don't work and like they use like the history book on the shelf as a way to repeat itself and like a quote from Waterloo and now Waterloo is just like, mm. like, like, at, like my brain cells right now. Just, like, I mean, we can play it. <laughs> Maybe like one sees on the internet an ABBA reference, Waterloo should immediately be well, specifically the lyrics from Waterloo. Yeah. Yeah, but then the rest of the song now just keeps playing like all of it. Mm. <laughs> mm. I don't know if I did it right, but anyway. I'm, I'm sure it's. I'm sure you've heard. I'm that sure it's great. Before. Yeah, I don't know if I did it right. Either. It's, it's all something that it's all good, right? It's all great. I know because we do writing workshops, mm -hmm. and students are always like, "Am I doing this right?" And it's like you're just doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the point. Do whatever. Right? Even better if it's if it's wrong, and we then did. we get to go in a different direction. Did oh, we do with you. workshops. And Israel is my former grad student at CU Boulder, and he was a joy. He was in, he was the only. Um, we're a guy, right, in the class of, of um, mostly cis queers, cis lesbians, and some other kind of other, yeah. But you were the only one. You hung in there with us. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> but I don't think we did anything like that. We didn't do writing answers mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was fun. Yeah, I would love to do more writing exercises. I would love to do more writing exercises. They're so fun. Yeah. They're so fun because mm -hmm. students who walk into a room all from different kinds of, you know, genders and races and classes and have assumptions about each other and mm -hmm. keep a distance and you know, just begin to cry with each other's stories and there's a kind of bonding that happens across difference that is very special. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's That's very right. healing. It's very, very healing. Mm -hmm. for a while. And they're always, they're always surprised that they end up becoming so close. Yeah. Wow. Is it like personal storytelling? I like to do, do, well, we do different ones. I, sometimes I do fiction, but then I realized because I'm at, I was at Seabold to Ethnic Studies that the students mostly liked doing memoir, which is just testimonial. Hmm. They're all now doing stories. Yeah. Yeah. I do crisis memoirs. Crisis memoirs. Yeah. Hmm. There's some very specific, you know, I like that the because that's memoir. usually what comes up. That's right. That's usually what comes up. I mean, I have students who'd say, oh, yeah, my brother was murdered. And, mm -hmm. Or my, brother, my sister committed suicide. Mm -hmm. or, you know. No, it's pretty amazing. You can come up. If you can squeeze that. Okay, I wasn't sure there was another entrance. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, the other entrance is there, but you can oh, the other way. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Is everyone happy with their stories? Sure. Okay, sure. great. Yeah. So now we're going to hold those stories with okay. us, and we're going to do a super short collective reading. So okay. I'm going to pass this book around, okay. and we're going to read this fabulous generative essay called Fierce.net, okay. Imagining a Faggity Web. Come on up, you guys. Come on up. Okay. Yeah, so that you can hear what's going on. Don't mm -hmm. be shy. Are y'all in? Yeah. I thought we got here early. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Are, you in the, are you here for the next one? Yeah, for the eleven uh, thirty. Oh no, you're mm. you're still we're still doing the first one, so you're gonna be part of this. Yeah, whether oh, you like it or not. Yeah, <laughs> just come hang out. Just hang out. Yeah, this is all about queer love anyway. All right. <laughs> all queer. It's all queer love. Okay, so um, I will start, and then we'll pass the book around, and I'm also gonna put it up on screen if it's. But actually, it's so it's way too small. So that's actually mm. we're just gonna practice active listening with each other. Um, so it starts, staring down the drop down. When registering for the cruise site, dadlad.com, a new user must choose how to identify herself from two choices in a drop down menu, dad or lad. She can only choose one. 
There are no intermediate options, no descriptors of greater flexibility, as in the variety of choices for describing safer sex preferences. Sometimes, most of the time, never, rather not say, let's discuss, or when appropriate. There is a dad slash lad workaround, however. Later in the profile creation form, a user can choose what type of partner she's searching for. There, she is allowed to make multiple selections. The form enables her to check dad and lad. So although her identity is fixed and singular, her appetites are allowed greater scope. She can be a dad looking for lads and other dads, or a lad looking for dads and other lads. I'm not merely grousing over inadequate representation here, complaining of my mirror mirror on the web's less than exact reflection. The profile system has material effects in the hookup economy. If I choose to label myself a dad, even though I note I am also hot for other dads, I may not show up on those dads' radars if they set their search parameters to look for only self-identified lads. It's tricky with dad lad. The terms are pretty loose and not strictly linked to age or physical body. There are lots of ripped young dads and graying lads out there. The appellations refer more, but not exclusively, exclusively to one's predilection for sexual dynamics and roles. In contrast, the bear community has a wider vocabulary describing roles with more shades of gray, if still rather fixed. Bear is generally for hairy, stocky guys with working class affinities. Cub for hairy and portly, but typically younger and or more submissive. Otter for hirsute but slender. <laughs> Muscle bear for gym damaged but furry. And trapper for, the, for those nearly hairy nor husky, but filling those who are. Typically, uniting all these is an appreciation for the rollicking blue collar inspired bear attitude or lack thereof. The drop down menu on dadlad.com, however, omits many sexual shades of gray. Say, he's a switch. To make, matters more, to make matters worse, he doesn't physically map clearly onto either role, neither twink nor silver fox. Mm -hmm. The menu requires him to make an inexact, ineffective, and counterproductive choice. I open with this admittedly somewhat petty anecdote as a concrete example of a larger concern. A drop-down menu is but one element of a user interface, but it is also one that is typically traditionally masculine. It organizes and categorizes. And though this asserts identity, knowledge, and understanding, um, oh, and through this asserts identity, knowledge, and understanding. Like Victorian scientist, or hell, Kinsey, putting his precisely labeled insect specimens and in puts you in a box, what you see in the label, in the search results, or in the profile in the museum display case is what you get. The drop-down menu doesn't do nuance. Worse yet, it suggests that there's something wrong with anyone or anything that doesn't fit in these clear-cut, self-explanatory, quote, natural options. Sure, you can express in your profile's personal statements the scope of your sexual tastes and practices as fully and with as much imagination as the text field's character limits will accommodate. But when you first encounter that drop-down, when you first look at the choices available, and note that there are none with which you can cleanly correspond, there's a moment of creeping doubt, of uncertainty, a nagging sense that there is something wrong with you. You should be one or the other. In my best thrift store drag of French philosopher historian Michel Foucault, I'm suggesting that if online user runs, if the online user runs up against enough moments of, of, of these moments of doubt, if she bumps up against them hard enough, maybe she starts trying to avoid them. Her, maybe she tries to simplify her complex identities and desires, tries to channel her tastes in a more specific direction throws out the vest with the faux leopard trim or the maroon herringbone slacks, but keeps the coveralls and cigars, instead of using both in her ensemble. Imagine all that is lost at dadlad.com. <laughs> Think of that exhilarating moment in cruising of staring down the unknown. Is he interested in me? Is his ass hairy? Does he kiss? Does he cry while getting fucked? Will he look me in the eye or zone out to some faraway place? In the online cruising experience, so many of these questions are already answered by profiles, correctly or incorrectly. And whether accurate or not, they deflate the mystery of the unknown, the sweaty, nervous, risky, stuttering, heart-thumping thrill of discovery and encounter. Uncovering a partner is exciting. The dodge and parry, the test and dance of sexual exploration and exposure. That moment he drops the facade and all of the tension and building and uncertainty leading up to it. Delicious. 
Online, it is often absent, diffused by the endless registration and profile screens. The exhibitionist runway of naked dude sky nude men hunters <laughs> gear boy shot fetish queer Romeo blah blah blah. That was all one word. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when you didn't know what someone looked like with their clothes off? Remember wondering what kind of cock he had? Remember shivering in anticipation? <laughs> <laughs> the suspense is terrible. I hope it lasts. <laughs> Consider that short guy with the choppy, tousled jet black hair, the furrowed, uncertain, anxious brow resting uneasily above the clear blue eyes. A young lad who seems to have his heart bursting out in need of love and affection from his strong, comfortable dad. Maybe it starts out that way with the older, more muscular, confidently swaggering guy with whom he hooks up. Maybe dad's salt and pepper crew cut, confident grin, and dark brown eyes lead to strong embraces, deep hugs, and chest nuzzling. Until the younger guy's switch kicks in and he starts calling dad boy and doing things to him that make him whimper. Moreover, what if he's a wise ass who wants to slip into some stockings while he disciplines his new boy? What if he laughs with a horrible, wicked, high-pitched, fake cackle, like a wicked witch, while he's got his hand in dad boy, doing awful things to him? What if he later cradles the older man in his arms, and then draws them both a hot bath with fresh lavender? Where do these faggots fit into the drop-down menu? The example of this humble and by now much maligned drop-down menu is an illustration of how the web is not neutral. The technologies that constitute the online experience did not appear out of thin air or descend from Olympus as gifts from the gods. They are not separate from culture or somehow innocent and pure, but as deeply intertwined with culture as an episode of The Hills. This design and functioning of online technologies is far from immune to racism, sexism, homophobia, and also other social ills. So this is like 2000. Yeah, so it's just all dated. Okay, imagine communities' fantasized interfaces, and the word fantasized is spelled like the beginning of phantom. Okay, nice. fantasized. I could continue to point out aspects of online experiences that are traditionally masculine and therefore avoid, resist, or otherwise erase the complex, mercurial, and multifaceted, the feminine, the fey, the femme, and the faggot. But rather than just reading the web's aspects of sexism, racism, or sissyphobia, I want to use a different technique. I want to imagine the opposite. I want to imagine what's lost what's elided through the process of thinking all of the ways of all of the ways the web could be but isn't. I want to point out how the web is such boring butch trade. One of those stupid as hair and bad hair at that, regular dude who just wants to drink beer on the couch and jerk off, bro, by imagining instead a queerer, more fabulous web, a faggoty web, an information super feyway, a journey into cyber femme, a worldwide sissy. What would that be like? White sissy. <laughs> Where did you finish? Okay. Well, for one thing, I wouldn't be sitting upright at a freaking desk. Anyone <laughs> knows sitting at a desk in a position of work, and in this fantasy, I'm not working, although I definitely work it. The fundamental body, position, muscle use, physical memory, and pose I strike should not be that of a desk jockey, office clone, or organization man. Ass and crotch, tucked away down below desk level, back upright, straight and tight, hands poised mid-air by my whole, my whole posture, all formal right angles. Oh, honey, no. Here I must lounge. Here I must be voluptuously loose and... Here I must curve beguilingly, as Tennessee Williams famously wrote in A Streetcar Named Desire. A line can be straight or a street, but the human heart, oh no, it's curved like a road through mountains. Well, so am I, damn it. So no desk for me, darling. I want to be supine on a couch, on a sofa, to lounge on a chase lounge, to swoon on a fainting couch, to dally on a day bed, to stretch recumbent on a recliner. It's very nice alliteration. Mm -hmm. my, cyber <laughs> my cyber world is not one fundamentally rooted in, wor in work, but in leisure and in pleasure. I must recline if I'm to be able to nap, stretch in the sun, cricket my legs together seductively, flash a little ass, let my scarves and skirts trail flowingly down the side of the divan. That's so lovely. <laughs> Do you so want to join us in, in the in reading? reading? Um, 
We're good. We're just observing yeah. right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, though. Okay. Yeah. Participant observers. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> um, mm. At least until I don't want to anymore. It's a queen's prerogative and a queer's obligation to change her fucking mind. <laughs> so when I need to move, move I must. When some retro acid house compilation torrent finishes downloading and starts playing, I need to dance, baby. And I can't do that tethered to a desk. When I'm reading someone, not some book, I need to storm around the room, tickling with gesticulations, pivoting on my points and counterpoints. My rhetoric entails runway. And while a lazy snap tossed over the back of an overstuffed couch has its moment, other times I need a full body torque to make a point to which no impotent emoticon comes close. So what kind of web does this entail? Something on bigger screens that I can see from more than a foot away. How about some widescreen wallpaper? How, how about a projector that plays my screen across an entire wall or upon the billowing silks of my window treatments? I know LCDs are expensive suites, but what about those groovy tricolor eye psychedelic projectors the sports bars all ditched? I always liked them. They had a War of the Worlds meets, meets Grace Slick vibe. And you could do all sorts of super shadow work in front of them. Not to mention that nasty trick of spraying your porn across the wall or your neighbor's wall. Hell, I can work with a Super 8 projector if the situation warrants. I'm not expensive or high maintenance, baby. I can adapt to the ex ex exigency. Pack my Hewlett Packard with, a tr with transparency sheets and slide the inkjet output tray up into an old opaque projector. <laughs> Mmm, huff the dusty high school goodness. Get yourself a hard-on from poppers and purple mimeographs. Poppers. Purple mimeographs. <laughs> What's a mimeograph? I'm, 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 what's a mimeograph? I love it. But you know what poppers are, though. Uh, that I do. Uh, that I'm familiar with. That used to be our, uh, you know, our way of, of making photocopies. We didn't make photocopies. You'd it would, it would be a machine. Like, you'd, you'd take a printed paper and you'd run it through a machine that would give you this, uh, this, this uh, like a blueprint. Mm -hmm. And then you'd run the blueprint into the machine that would make you the duplicated copies. So they oh, all came right. out. Oh, yeah, they all came oh out. yeah, that's how old we are. Wow. Yeah, 70s. <laughs> this is what you did. This is how you and then So you'd cool. Leaflet. Yeah. You would leaflet. That's all you had. I mean, because that's how you got disseminated the information. And that's how you would produce posters, you know, that you had made the DIY. Wow. Yeah, why is Van old? Yeah. <laughs> Everything was purple? Everything was purple because the ink Everything was purple, like a yeah. blue ink, and so hmm. it came out And then it would purple. fade, and fade yeah. and fade, right? And then you'd barely be able to read it, but you'd still... Yeah, so if you're in your archival wow. research, if you ever find any of those, you know how old that is. Mm -hmm. That's very archival stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 60s and 70s. Wow, oh, I want to see what that looks like. Okay. <laughs> I have some in my own archive. It's yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The things we did. Mm -hmm. That was it. Rotary phones. That was what we had. Rotary phones. <laughs> I know. And poppers are still around. They're still here. <laughs> That's the common denominator. Uh, <laughs> across the generation. Poppers. There's some in the bag, right? That we got for yeah. the conference? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. That's I, Along with the condoms. Yeah, okay. Oh, perfect. The condoms. Good. Good. <laughs> <gasps> Those were fun. Now and joke too hard, it'll end up on Fox News. Oh, oh, Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> um, we're almost almost done. Okay. Um, so I want big pictures, large text. Don't cram everything in so I can see it all at once, honey. I like to scroll. It's like a sachet. Zooming is a snap. I don't need some all-at-once Archimedean vantage point. I want a web I can explore, not survey. A cyberspace of cubby holes, eddies, and dark private booths. Mm. I want to zoom, rotate, slide around, and manipulate the screen image with pinchy, strokey, snappy finger motions on a touchscreen or touchpad. Why hasn't that long been our primary user experience in all applications? Why can't large text and graphics with twisty, zippy, pinchy navigation be projected on giant wall screens? Think about it, imagine it. Imagine all you could do, all you could do differently. How much more a faggot campy web could work it? Audio and video chatting would be, could become more integral. Everyone doesn't need a super fast T1 connection to do it. Even dial-up can do audio and, and hell. Notch my visual down to a low res and frequent refresh. I love flash as much as I love sparkles, sequin, and glitter. Why not? Just free my hands from this fucking keyboard. 
I want you to see my arched eyebrows and rolling eyes, to hear the shade dripping from my words. Feel the sonic boom of my snap. Twist inside my shrieks and giggles. Give your eyes a rest and my hands one too, because there are much better things they could be doing. Much better, baby. Hmm. Think of how much more meaning we could have, the intensified nuance, subtlety, inflection, irony, sarcasm, and flirtation we could communicate. How we could signify, how we could read. If freed from this hex of TXT, I can't type in nails and baubles. Give me more and better voice operated operation, audio controls with consistent commands across applications and platforms so I can input while testing out a new pair of platforms. <laughs> Finally, to return to where I began, forms are fucked. Screw registration, age verification, and marketing, marketing tracking info gathering. I can have as many identities as I want. My profile is a mood ring, all descriptors open-ended with nothing required. I, I can put in any response to any criteria I want. If I want to cruise a chat room and show you nothing but a picture of me biting a gummy eyeball, so be it. <laughs> I can lurk in the shadows and show or hide as suits my caprice. Hooking up should not be rational calculation. Seduction should not be schematic. And if you don't understand that, you don't know what you're missing. <clears throat> Randomize is the next best thing to accessorize. I don't search for specifics. I browse, wander, cruise, poke, and pick through record bins and use clothes by the pound. Bump into friends rather than targeting them. Accidents happen, and I love them. Bring on synchronicity, coincidence, and conspiracy. Such is the stuff of spirit, awe, and wonder. I have laughter and amazement, not search results. I have unexpected longings, not hierarchical ratings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <How> kind. <laughs> I prance among my large-scale, graphics-rich, immersive projected web, tossing off voice commands and burning through chat cubbies and bear caves, flying over Paris and sighing over a new crush. I savor depth, hues, sounds, and smells. This isn't just virtual reality. Too many issues of Mondo 2000 wore out that wet dream. I am not trapped inside some other world. No, I have decorated, meshed, embellished, and beautified this world with my online friends, loves, and thrift shops. First life, baby. No sloppy second lives. Perhaps I seem a bit bipolar, blowing up from a cruise site's lowly drop-down menu to my reimagined fantasy web. But as some big modernist once said, God is in the details. The key to getting out of a bad relationship is being able to imagine something more fulfilling. We don't need to settle for the info highway as planned by rational bureaucrats. Imagine, look for, support, and help create something better. And I said to myself, is that all there is to the internet? Is that it? That's the end of it? Mm -hmm. Awesome. End. I like that. That was hilarious. Tell us the, who's the author? Uh, D. Travers Scott. D. Travers. Who I think is a professor at the University of Cincinnati. But the, but the book itself is called what? The book is called Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots okay. oh, that's by good. Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. Okay. Is she the editor then? Yes. She's the editor, yes. That was the one I was mentioning earlier. The person who wrote the book about like queer like 80s, 90s Boston is the same author. Oh, oh really? Mm -hmm. oh. Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. Mm -hmm. She's a, is that the new book that yeah, she just released? she just released it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's about like queer like 90s Boston, I think. Okay. Pre-assimilation. Yeah, I lived in the 80s. Definitely not assimilated then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No okay. One. So now I thought using that as the sort of the, the motivating force, mm -hmm. we could read out um, our the anecdotes that we wrote down. Okay. And then use that as a sort of um, and I I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I have this Google Doc called Protocols for a Queer Cyberspace mm -hmm. and sort of just like write down the kind of ideas that so we'll read them and then kind of collectively discuss how could we imagine that experience but faggier but more but but with more possibilities so using our own stories as the kind of fuel to imagine something beyond what we've what we've have okay mm -hmm. do you want to start um you didn't write one down. I didn't actually write one down so, you yeah, to start. Okay. so I didn't um, form complete sentences. I more took notes. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of like 
-hmm. improv, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I'll just tell the story. So I was, when I first moved to Boston after undergraduate, I was looking to make friends. And so I turned actually, of all places, to OkCupid. Okay and I basically put my profile that I was looking for it to be like half of a queer power couple. Um, <laughs> and my, uh, this person named Emma reached out to me like was asking. it you? <laughs> um, now we know. And we ended up getting a uh, coffee. We immediately realized we weren't really attracted to one another, but it's still sort of, we had this moment of like, we could be, there's this possibility. We didn't, we weren't afraid to reach out to each other. We both were like, okay, we're interested in queerness. We ended up becoming really, really like best friends. Nice. Um, and we actually formed this other community from this interaction called FemShare, where we like, got together to discuss sort of different topics related to fem like feminism. It was kind of like the, the consciousness raising groups, but mm, nice. we didn't know that at the time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We were just doing it. Um, yeah. But also that was also mediated via the internet. We mostly found people for that space mm -hmm. through the internet, through other like dating things and through like Facebook. And so kind of like back and forth between the internet as a space to like meet people, but then kind of going back and forth on and off, on and off, on and off. It sort of nice. like that. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, I did write complete sentences, so <laughs> Good. I'll breeze through it. Um, it's November of 2011. At this point, my relationship with my now ex-boyfriend has become verbally and emotionally abusive, mm -hmm. auguring a much darker period to come. I was studying economics, doing poorly in school, and addicted to drugs. But then, one night, I sent him a song that I liked <clears throat> on Facebook Messenger. It was an electronic track, although I don't really remember which one. I mean, I was on drugs, right? Like, <laughs> I'm on a shit ton of Xanax and cocaine, so I'm not the guy no, you're not gonna remember. be able to remember anything that happened. <laughs> Apparently, I remember most of this. Um, his response illuminated something for me. He said, electronic music is gay music because it is future-oriented. It rejects the present and yearns for a better tomorrow. Mm. We actually, neither of us had read Jose Munoz at this point, too, which wow. is pretty cool that he had like, formulated yeah. this thought on his own. Mm. Yeah. Um, but he was, and is, unfortunately, a Lee Edelman kind of gay anyway. No, no. Um, and he ended his bad. diatribe with a, it I is. don't like your music. I don't like, I don't like what? Your, your music. music. Wow. Well, that Whoa. explains and then everything. And that, like, binaristic division between us kind of became apparent to me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that explained it all. Mm -hmm. And then you were done. <laughs> it's never, we're never quite done. Yeah. yeah. Let's say, like, I was maybe done with him by like mid 2012. Yeah, it takes a while. Yeah. It takes a while. Yeah, I've been there. 20 years old, what's he gonna do? Exactly. I know. Sucks. Short and sweet. Uh, I grew up in a small country town where no one talked about non heteronormativity, much less in a positive way. At 16, I met another queer 16 year old online, and he lived yeah. two towns over. Yeah, because when you're from the country, you measure things, mm. you measure distance <laughs> and towns over. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> as I'm sure you're aware of. I'm very aware. Um, we made a date, we met, and we each had our first kiss. So. Mm. Oh, awesome. Mm. Wholesome. Nice. Truly. Wholesome. <laughs> but your offering is wholesome. Right. There's okay. more. I'll allow it. <laughs> I was practicing reading tarot cards on an anonymous chat website. Actually, I had a lot of things that I wanted to talk about, but the search terms for makeup, punk rock, and astrology inevitably inundated me with the ASL that I didn't want to answer or couldn't answer correctly. So I would usually find people with other things on their minds, such as the tarot tag. Mm -hmm. I could discuss anything and everything, reach out to queer kids, dole out life advice since I'm older and have been through everything. I identified myself to someone who identified themselves as a woman in her 40s. I talked her through her problems and she listened to mine. When we signed off, she said, I can feel your soul, Michael, and you're a beautiful man. Alma and I renewed our vows on August 16, 2018, our 10th anniversary in Hawaii this summer. We were standing on the sand of Waikiki Beach on a breezy Thursday morning, wearing lays and pronouncing our love for each other after 10 years of marriage. And our little girl, Azul Fernanda, was with us. We posted the pictures on Facebook and felt all the love from our friends and family from all over the world, even Ireland and Spain and Mexico. I love bringing our radical Chicana lesbian romance into the phones and iPads and computers of my 750 plus FB friends. 
I remember that. It's just this. Okay, so on Twitter, I have kind of lines, um, pair, um, what is it called? Bullet points. On Twitter, I self identify as a, a queer butch lesbian since 1972. And I was asked in a tweet by a really by Latina, very central by the way, what mm. my self identity means given the historical trajectory of queer, butch, lesbian, bi, gender non conforming, trans, non binary. So the tweeting then became public flirtation uh, with this queerly bi, as we discussed, queerly bi, butch, fan, Latinx. And then it became sexting. So there's an upcoming date. So I'm just wondering, without the immediacy, immediacy of the internet, right, would this kind of sensual sexual eroticism have manifested so quickly? Mm. So it creates this sense of intimacy, and then you wonder, well, is it real? Is it false? Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. well, we'll see. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> yeah, stay in the so possibility. Cute. I mean, make it happen, but keep the brain going in that possibility space of what could happen. I know, I know. Because we're both into language. Mm -hmm. So that's the process, mm. is that we both enjoy language so much. Mm -hmm. She's also a writer, and of course, Colin, you all agree, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, you will. And if not, you will. Yeah. No, she's written a few books. Wow. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm pretty excited. So this is why I'm writing about it. We yeah. haven't talked in a while. You haven't. You don't know. It's been a crazy semester. It's been a crazy semester. You only know about the previous yeah. one. That you, you read cards for me. He's a very good, terrible. Guy. Oh, mm. <laughs> bring my deck with me. Did wow. you didn't bring your deck? I should have. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, bought mine. Bought mine too. Did you bring yours? I mean, they're not oh. me, but they're the Airbnb. See. Hmm. You never know. Yeah, I know. That's right. I feel like you should know when you're coming to a queer conference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your yeah. I know I should. <laughs> I know. Throw them out. Let's just do it. <laughs> Did cool you bring yours, Haley? Yeah. It'd be a cool yeah. panel to present oh at QGrad. Yeah. And you know, kind of like a standard uh -huh. part of it. It's yeah. like I was at um, uh, the queer conference at Hampshire College that happens mm -hmm. in the Five College every year out in Western Mass. And there was a great panel on queer tarot really? one year when I was mm. I was like twenty and I was so excited oh, about wow. it. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing how many of us yeah. do it? I now? know astrology, mm. too. astrology too. Did you all see Otto Straddle's like like poll thing that they did recently on like queerness and like alternative religions and like ghosts and spirituality and astrology? Yeah. Yeah. Oh no! no. It's it's so good. Weird. They have a whole series. They did a big yeah. poll and then they've every week they put out like a different like. Yeah. Like analytic of it, it's really great. And it was like a scientific yeah. poll, not like yes. please submit. Yeah, yeah. sweet, yeah. that's dope. Yep. Auto shadow for the best. Yeah, I love auto yeah. shadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great. <laughs> Truly. But um, yeah, and then the different decks, the ones you, the one you choose, the yeah. one you choose is important, yes. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one you've had for like thirty years. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. I love, I, for a while, I was collecting them too, and like. Like, oh, you're queer, you want to try? I have this other one I got. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. Great yeah. exercise, by yeah, the way. Do you have one to share? Um, no. I, well, no. Is an there another one? part to this? Thing? An old one. Yeah, so the next part was so sort of taking what we shared, uh -huh. and then I've got some, and whether or not we can either use these are little, so there's a, a web browser, mm -hmm. and then also a phone. Okay. And so thinking about how we could draw and imagine kind of like what are the other ways, given the stories that we've shared, mm -hmm. um, what we could take out of those given the reading, um, just sort of like a quick kind of drawing prototyping exercise mm -hmm. of the future imaginary mm -hmm. of the web mm -hmm. or the phone or the things around the web. So there's also blank pieces of paper in case this is too much of a, because I realized that there's a box on this page and we're <laughs> thinking about expanding outside of that. Yeah, if you want to um, Yeah. Yeah, like blank, blank pages. I don't understand. Sorry? I don't understand. What we're doing? Yeah. The next stage? Yeah. Um, so is, it, is this connected to our story at all, or is this just something, something yeah. separate? Um, no, I mean, it could be connected to, and it could also, we can either sort of do it independently or thinking through, like if we picked one mm -hmm. and sort of thought, like, how, what role did the internet play in that sort of, so like in, in the case of, mm -hmm. of yours, there's the sort of like, 
you were you were thinking about like the immediacy that the mm -hmm. web provides mm -hmm. as something that that's really working in terms of like how mm -hmm. how the like the eroticism is mm -hmm. building and how mm -hmm. people are communicating with one another mm -hmm. and so then an example sort of being is like how how could we think that as like a a, a deliberate strategy um, or how could we augment that strategy? In this case, it's it's something that's worked quite well. Yeah. So it's like, is there a, is there is there something? Can we take the the way that that works on Twitter, and apply that to a new form of communication that doesn't uh -huh. have some of the things that maybe we don't like that about are restrictive Twitter. about Twitter? Yeah. 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 Ooh, that's a good question, and I have no fucking idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But it's a good question, how to do that. Because mm -hmm. so much of that becomes, it's organic, right? It just, so, it's somehow when you're, you're doing it, mm -hmm. it emerges. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to do that. I mean, then you start DMing, right? And you start, mm -hmm. start making it private because the public yeah. becomes too, too much. Totally. Yeah. 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 But then I want to maybe then maybe then there's a sort of question in there of like a what if like mm -hmm. what if the DM like the DM is sort of if we can imagine it as the sort of like the divide between the public space and the private mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. and if we ima in our in our imagined queer sexual futurity mm -hmm. do we want do is it exciting to bear witness to other mm -hmm. people's flirtation mm -hmm. that one would other hide in sort of a DM it's, space yeah. so could there be this sort of chat space in which yeah. we're all bearing witness to to our friends and our loved ones yeah. erotic desires do we want maybe we don't want that maybe that's something exciting that we could explore mm -hmm. um, what would that look like I think it's fun though I mean that's part of the fun the, the titillation is to make it public mm -hmm. but then you but then you become selective I mean when you're a fiction writer you think about that a lot right mm -hmm. yeah yeah you but, think about okay this is these are the part but even then I mean how much do we as people I mean we're all performing mm -hmm. right? so it becomes okay this is part of the performance that I will offer performance that I would just do with my mm. sexual other, right? There's also like a fear of the fact of the matter is like queer interactions are stigmatized and like there is like a risk of like violence. He even mentioned that sort of at the very beginning. Like I've always imagined like, okay, there's a really cool queer person on the train. Mm -hmm. I want to have it like go like sit over like chat be like, oh my God, you're so cool. I just want like, I like your style. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I've always kind of imagined like what if there was just sort of like a like other queer people, like non-dating grinder, but it's not even just grinder because it's not for hookups. Yeah. But then also, I'm, there's also yeah. this concern of like, well, then anyone can go on there, find who you are, yeah. like track you down. There, yeah. There's always this fear at the same yeah. time, like yeah. blocking us mm -hmm. from actually connecting in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious how like the yeah. the anonymity part could be helpful. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But I like that though. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, this is to your point on Grindr, you know, there is this whole friends looking for friends thing. Yes. And my concern always with these conversations about technology is we get a little too caught up in the technological determinism mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. don't talk about the, the sort of wider cultural ways in which these technologies are structured, right? So like with Grindr, theoretically, you could go looking for friends there, yeah. but there's different value systems at work, and especially, unfortunately, among my community, right, like West Hollywood gay guys, it's this like biological essentialist sexual value system that is so predominant that people get on Grindr and look only for partners, whatever that may be, that, that have value ascribed to this through this really disgusting and patriarchal way of looking at the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't wow. know how technologically you address that. That's like something, and I mm -hmm. like barely can use my email, so I don't know technologically anything. But, <laughs> but. Uh -huh. Wow, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me just interject something for the people who just walked in. You're probably coming to the 11 a.m. panel, right? Yeah, we're running a little late, so it's okay if you all just you know want to join in the conversation or just mm -hmm. you know watch mm -hmm. us. <laughs> Whatever. I just think it would be nice if there were like an intermediary between like a grinder esque location thing and like Instagram, right? Because Instagram, I want to follow people, I want to see their outfits, I want to see what they look like, I want to see their sure. queer aesthetics, right? Sure. Sure. But at the same time, like how do you find those people? Like you can look at tags, but that's also limiting and weird. I, like sometimes you just want to like mm. see who's around and also like who are you missing around you? There's, there's always cool queer people near you, there's hidden from each other. Exactly. How do we find each other and not like and sex is like sex is important. We should it shouldn't we shouldn't exclude sex. Sex is sure. just part of this, but it shouldn't always have to be sexuality. I'm not sure. I'm sort of like, who are we like? 
Like, we should be able to find each other aesthetics without having to, like, only be in these sexual spaces. It should be, like, both. Mm -hmm. Fluid between the two. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Can I just ask, um, in terms of querying the map, Dot com. If we wanted to like put that story that we just read onto creating the map, mm -hmm. so we go online mm -hmm. and uh, and we don't have to create an account or anything. No, there's no. Because that's always totally, to me that's always like such a pain. Totally. One more of the million passwords that I'm not, never going to remember, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you know my my computer stores, but then you change the computer and mm -hmm. it's like oh shit. Uh, oh, so so we just go on there and then we locate the place. Exactly. And that's it. And then yeah. you click that place and then you write about it. Yeah. And you put like, well, I could just pipe, put that little story in there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then it gets put into the moderation panel. And then it, so it appears immediately mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. but publicly it has to be moderated. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and then within like two or three days, then it's on this okay. map okay. publicly. I remember I used it right when it first, or that first sort of boom before the Trump stuff happened. I remember putting mine and being like, this is so amazing. I like wrote my story, I put it on there. It was so good. Mm -hmm. I was so excited about it. That's why I was like so excited this panel was here. I was like, because oh, <laughs> yeah. it was such an amazing experience. Yeah. Like, yeah, like the idea of like, and like I love showing it just as like <laughs> my like straight coworkers are like, I'm just like on here looking and it's like this big black, black map full of just like, like look queer, at it. Queer encounters. We're queering it and just sort of like being like, look. And they're like, like they're always like astounded at how many there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is similar to a project that I do in one of my writing classes, uh, which is like the La Latino queer noir, mm -hmm. uh, where hmm. students write a noir story, but they also need to map it, right? Because it's about Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so we travel to different places and then they go, students go to different places. And then the, uh, the places that are actually on the map are places in their stories that then they, they take excerpts from their stories and they, you know, put them into the, populate the field oh, whoa. with those stories. And so at the end, we can like expand the map and we can, we can basically create one huge collective story that we can read in all of these different ways mm -hmm. as opposed to just the linear way of everybody, mm -hmm. yeah. Totally, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is, yeah, it's exactly the same yeah. sort of idea exactly. behind, behind querying the map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. and That's I, so I, I cool. love it, and the students, of course, would love it too, so it's a whole new way of you know, in, in entangling your, your fiction with the, the World Wide Web. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this and with great. other people that you have that you have no sort yeah. of, but you immediately kind of care for mm -hmm. in this sort of like reading their their, their stories yeah. in an anonymous right. platform. One of the comments you said uh, earlier when you're in your in your presentation was the notion of sharing vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. yes. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Because exactly because it it's so empowering. I mean, you, it's 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 contradictory because you're sharing you're sharing vulnerability that's empowering, it's, you know. But it's intimacy. Yeah, it's it creates intimacy that you're not expecting. And connection through the intimacy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where the power is. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Really yeah. I'm really looking forward to what you're going to be submitting for Queer Cats. Because it's just, it's an open access online journal. Mm -hmm. You can actually like click right on and get taken right to the queer map. Oh, amazing! Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I've got lots and lots and lots of writing about this project. That's incredible. That's, great. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Is yeah. there anything other part that we are missing? Um, I think maybe I. It's. I guess we can sort of. Yeah, because we're kind of running. Because we're running out of time, um, and I think yeah, it was. This was a really generative conversation. Yes, it sure was. To have. Absolutely. Yeah, they're for you. Um, the only, I just wanted to read, there's, so there's one point on querying the map that I think okay. is so brilliant in terms of creating a coalitional politic, particularly between queer and indigenous people, um, that's in Hawaii. And so I wanted to close with this one. Um, so it reads, this school taught me a lot about what it means to be, sorry, I'm going to look at it here, to what it means to be Hawaiian, to be queer, or sorry, yeah, to be queer and to be both somewhere in between and somewhere not at all. The story of my people I was told by many teachers, left out ancestors who loved indiscriminate of gender and even broke beyond the binaries of it. This is where I fell in love for the first time, where my heart was broken and where I learned that decolonization must mean queer liberation and that queer liberation must mean decolonization. Wow. So beautiful good. ending. So beautiful ending. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.